Hello everyone, welcome. Uh, this is Mr. Dempsey again. Uh, today we're going to be looking at uh, Unit 5-5, Modern Techniques of Biotechnology, Part B. And we're going to be exploring the genetic code of DNA instructions and how it can be manipulated to create new combinations. Specifically, we'll be exploring how DNA can be turned on and turned off, what are some practical applications of recombinant DNA technology, how is recombinant DNA technology different from cloning, why is DNA the universal code, and why does that make transgenic organisms possible? And finally, how can the genetic code be edited? So let's first explore the LAC operon. So the LAC operon is a genetic uh, a series of genes that are found in bacteria such as E. coli, which live in your large intestine. Now, normally, uh, let's say these E. coli may not have access to a sugar found in milk called lactose, so they would want to turn that gene off. Why? go through the process of transcription and translation and make proteins, enzymes for example, involved in the breakdown of uh, the sugar lactose if it's not present. So turn that off. The way that works is there's a, imagine we uh, have a series of genes here which are involved in the breakdown of that sugar here, and we'll look at those soon. And let's say we have upstream of this gene an area called the promoter. The promoter is a, a place where RNA polymerase can uh, attach to the DNA and ultimately then start to transcribe genes downstream. Farther upstream, we have a gene that's going to be making a protein, a repressor. And this repressor, as we're going to see, can bind to the promoter, blocking RNA polymerase from transcribing those downstream genes. We also see in this picture that the sugar in milk, lactose, potentially could bind to that repressor protein, change its shape, and therefore in inactivate that protein. So let's look at how the process works. So let's say that uh, right now there is no lactose present in your large intestine, and so right now we're going to be having this gene turned off. So therefore the repressor is bound to the DNA, blocking the RNA polymerase from transcribing these genes down here. So the bacterium is saving energy, not um, expressing those uh, enzymes made by those genes. However, let's say that you do eat some lactose found in milk, and you can see that that lactose is going to bind to that repressor, inactivating it, so it's going to pull it off from this area right here. Normally, um, it is bound to that region, as you can see here, but with the lactose, it's going to alter the shape of the protein, causing it to pull away from that promoter area, thus enabling RNA polymerase to then transcribe those genes and ultimately get energy from the sugar. So we've seen the gene is now turned on, whereas now it is turned off. So that is a system that allows bacteria to have some regulation of how they use their genes. Let's look at another idea, uh, and that is um, we're now seeing how um, bacteria have these plasmids inside them. And so to kind of look at the overview, in the previous slide, we saw that individual bacteria can respond to their environment by turning on and turning off genes. In this next idea of the recombinant DNA technology, imagine that bacteria uh, reproduce through an asexual process. So when they do that, their descendant cells really have the same genetic information that the original cell had, except for the occasional mutation. Now, maybe there is a useful mutation that may enable the bacteria to survive some type of an environment. Maybe there's an antibiotic present in the environment, for example, and the bacteria could share potential genes with other bacteria, thus enabling those bacteria to have uh, resistance to an antibiotic. Another thing we're going to be exploring here is the idea that um, bacteria evolve restriction enzymes as a way to defend themselves from certain viruses. We saw that in our previous video. So now let's take those two concepts and uh, consider this question. That all life has evolved to use DNA as its genetic code to transcri transcribe and translate genes into proteins. How might people use this understanding to create technologies to help people? So we're going to be looking at the idea of a plasmid uh, and that of a restriction enzyme to see how we could potentially alter DNA and make a transgenic organism. Let's begin that idea by looking at a plasmid. Recall that plasmids can be traded between bacteria as a way of uh, gaining some new genetic trait. So imagine we were to sort of hijack that plasmid or borrow it from a bacterium and alter it for human benefit. So what we might want to do is we might want to add a desired gene into that plasmid. But in order to do that, we have to first cut the plasmid open. 
So in our last video we saw that restriction enzymes are sort of like a molecular scissor that can cut the DNA. In this case, we're going to be cutting it not straight through that double helix, but notice that there is this kind of zigzag pattern. And that's going to create what are known as sticky ends. So we can uh, take a desired gene, maybe a human gene for example, and then we're going to insert that into the plasmid. But we need a glue in order to do that. And the opposite of a restriction enzyme is a glue that can bind our human DNA, in this case, maybe to that plasmid. Consider what that type of enzyme might be. And if you said DNA ligase, you are correct. DNA ligase would then glue that new piece into our plasmid. So what are some potential benefits of recombinant DNA technology? So consider this. With medicine, uh, in the old days, it would take 8,000 pounds of cow or pig pancreas to equal one pound of insulin that could be given to a person like a diabetic. So there's a, a type of diabetes called type 1 diabetes, and these people cannot make human insulin. Uh, so it would have been um, uh, harvested from these pig or cow pancreases, which is not very efficient. Um, or, and there's also people with, which have allergies to that, by the way. Uh, or it may have been uh, taken from human cadavers, um, and that's not always difficult to get either. So, um, back in the 70s and 80s, people found a way to take human DNA and put it into a plasmid, as I discussed in the previous slide, and therefore make human insulin, and that can be extracted from the uh, bacteria safely, and then sold to people who are um, in, in need of it because of diabetes, type 1 diabetes specifically. Next idea. Uh, let's look at agriculture here down this next picture with our corn. So corn is the number one crop in the United States, and nearly all of our corn, 88%, is genetically modified. So we sometimes call these GMOs or genetically modified organisms. Now one of the reasons why people do this is because you, know, you might need to use a lot of pesticides to keep off certain insects from eating the crops. However, there are organisms that make chemicals that can uh, inhibit or even kill those insects. And there is a bacteria that makes a naturally occurring toxin not harmful to people. And people identified that gene and put it into corn and other plants. And so that corn will then grow up to make this naturally occurring toxin, um, killing certain pests and have no uh, health uh, cost to people. And the benefit of that is you don't have to use pesticides, you know, these chemicals that are put onto your crops. Next idea is let's look at uh, scientific research. So here we're looking at a neuron that's grown on a petri dish. And um, if we're trying to cure a certain disease, we may need to know how that neuron functions. And it's hard to kind of visualize that. So what's been put into this neuron is a gene from a jellyfish. That gene um, is called green fluorescent protein. And under a special black light, this can glow in, in the microscope. And so we can visualize the uh, neurons and um, see how it interacts or behaves when we treat it with certain types of medicines and so forth as a way of trying to help people with things like Alzheimer's and other uh, diseases. Next we're going to explore the idea of how is uh, recombinant DNA technology different from cloning. All right, here's a sheep you may have heard of. Uh, the sheep is named Dolly. Dolly was born in 1996. In this particular picture, uh, we see Dolly now. She has passed away. Uh, this is a taxidermied specimen of her at the uh, National Museum of Scotland. And uh, she's considered to be the world's most famous sheep because she was actually born from one mammary cell taken from a sheep. And that, sh that uh, cell was then used to make an entirely new animal, in this case, Dolly the sheep. How does that process work? Well, imagine that we have a uh, this cell that's been taken from the mammary gland from um, a sheep. And what we need to do is grow that into an entirely uh, new individual from that one cell. So eggs have the capacity to grow into embryos. So we want to take an egg. could come from the same sheep we got the mammary gland from, or it could come from another individual uh, female. And the haploid nucleus is then removed with a pipette. So now you have an emptied egg cell. The diploid cell from that mammary gland is then inserted into that emptied egg. And then that em emptied egg will grow into an embryo. The embryo then can be placed into a surrogate mother, such as an, uh, a, mo you know, a mother which has, of course, a womb, which then can nourish that baby, and the baby is then born from that surrogate mother. 
So you've cloned that baby from that one diploid cell. So that's called reproductive cloning in that process, and that's how Dolly was made. Um, and since that time, there's been uh, pets like dogs and cats that have been cloned, even some primates. Um, but there are laws in many countries, including the United States, of uh, reproductive uh, of cloning humans in that process as Dolly was done. A more popular uh, type of uh, cloning is called therapeutic cloning. So you can imagine that there is a person with a spinal cord injury or some kind of neurological damage, or maybe that's even you one day. How can we actually cure that or fix that? One potential way to do that is to take one of your cells, so imagine we're taking one of your diploid cells from your skin or from your brain cells or some part of your body. It could even just be regular skin cells. And by putting that, um, that, that diploid nucleus from a skin cell into an egg like this, we would be able to make cells that would then um, be able to perhaps turn into neurons and put those into your brain. So it's almost like we're reprogramming the DNA similar to what we saw in that lac operon where now we're taking the uh, cells from a skin, turning off DNA, which would normally be used in skin cells, and then turning on other genes in that same cell to make uh, proteins involved in, let's say, neurons to then treat you in this process of therapeutic cloning. All right, in our last idea, we're going to be exploring the idea of genome editing. All right, so the basic uh, concept here is that you may have heard of this idea of basic science that people are uh, studying um, some seemingly obscure organism like some fungus or a bacterium. Like, why would people spend all this time and effort on trying to learn about some slimy little creature in some obscure place in the world? Well, in the case of restriction enzymes, remember that these are viral defenses discovered in bacteria back in the 60s and 70s. And those uh, restriction enzymes have become the major uh, molecular tool, or uh, like scissors in this case, which cut DNA at desired areas. And that is fundamental to things like um, trans making transgenic organisms, like I discussed uh, a little bit earlier. Another example is uh, TAC polymerase. This is an enzyme that was first found in a uh, hot spring dwelling prokaryote that uh, lives in Yellowstone National Park, or was at least first discovered there. Um, and so that enzyme, uh, TAC polymerase, was then used in the 1980s in this process of polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, which has revolutionized our ability to copy DNA and uh, make lots of quantities of it for uh, research and um, medicine and so forth. Finally, um, last idea here is we're looking at how bacteria have this ability to absorb uh, plasmids from other bacteria. Um, and by studying the bacteria and how they do this process, it's helped us learn how to do recombinant DNA technology where we can take those plasmids, genetically change them with our restriction enzymes, for example, and add desired genes. So the idea is by studying nature carefully, we're able to often um, create technologies from that, from that basic research. A more recent example of this happened uh, just in the last few years. The woman on the right-hand side, her name is Jennifer Dodna. She is a professor at the University of California, Berkeley. And as the slide says, a transformative gene engineering technology began with curiosity about how bacteria fight viruses. So our immune system, our white blood cells, have this immunological memory, the ability to remember a past infection like a virus or a bacterium. Uh, and uh, bacteria have a, a different process, but that process then was uh, used to create a, a genome editing tool, which I'm now going to explain to you. So imagine that, that in your body, we want to alter your genes. And I'm talking about you right now as a living organism, not some embryo, but you. All right, so let's say that you have a genetic disease or we want to change some part of your genome. So this target sequence then can be um, guided with uh, our CRISPR-Cas9. This is something that Jennifer Dodna, uh, Dodna discovered in bacteria. And that CRISPR-Cas9 system, which bacteria uh, evolve CRISPR, the CRISPR-Cas9 system is going to replace a targeted DNA area with a new version of that gene. In this case, maybe it's a desired uh, mutation, like a desired change in genetic information. Let me give you a real example of how that's um, being investigated. So it turns out um, 
about 1% of the human population has inborn resistance to HIV. That means they can't get AIDS, which is fairly remarkable if you think about that. And the reason why that's the case is because they lack uh, a protein or they have a deformed protein on their white blood cells, which is depicted here. And that is uh, a CCR5 uh, receptor protein, which HIV, the virus that causes AIDS, would normally use to attach to their white blood cells. And if you have a missing or deformed CCR5 protein, then uh, HIV can attach to your white blood cells and therefore you cannot get AIDS. So the way that would be done back with our CRISPR-Cas9 system that Jennifer Doden and others discovered was to, uh, to replace that, uh, that gene. And so this was done in uh, September of 2017. Some Chinese scientists reported progress on using CRISPR-Cas9 to uh, edit people's, or not people, this was done in a petri dish, but to edit uh, white blood cells and replace the normal gene for CCR5 with this mutated one therefore potentially making it so those white blood cells would not be able to get infected by uh, HIV. If this was done in a person, um, we would of course have to change all those cells. You have to go down to the bone marrow to do, do, to do this. Then you could make a person resistant to um, AIDS. So we're still a long way off from that, but uh, the, pro the point is, is that um, discoveries like this in basic research lead to new innovative technologies. So thank you for watching. Um, I hope you look forward to uh, my next video. Thank you very much.